right, attention roll call. Colors green. The Adam Boyd, Charlie David Eddy, 1099, 2100 Meal. DeAngelis? Stop. You have the TS? Also, Greenwich and Late Street. They're shooting a movie down there. Explosions, actors dressed as cops. Might be get some phony runs down there. Just be alert down there. Okay, uh, all right, Wally, let's hit the low beams on all the cars, please, all right? Julie, where are the EMS people? The EMS people are, um... People, I need you out here. We can't do it. Come on, people, let's go to work. Sidney Lumet directs a scene from his 38th film, Q and A. It's a typical Lumet subject, a drama about corruption and racism in the New York police force. It's also typical in the way Lumet has submerged himself in the subject and in the degree of collaboration between director, actors and technicians. That's when he came through and wound up in a If you've got a third, put them together, because if you've got a third, I need to over here. I respond to a script or an idea completely instinctively. Don't analyze it. Don't try to fit it into a preconceived notion of what I want. And then after a number of years, I can look back and I say, oh, that's what I was interested in that, at that time. Um, quite obviously, the whole justice system involves me enormously, and I don't know why. It's always difficult to keep personal prejudice out of a thing like this. And wherever you run into it, prejudice always obscures the truth. I don't really know what the truth is. I don't suppose anybody will ever really know. Nine of us now seem to feel that the defendant is innocent. But we're just gambling on probabilities. We may be wrong. We may be trying to let a guilty man go free. I don't know. Nobody really can. But we have a reasonable doubt, and that's something that's very valuable in our system. No jury can declare a man guilty unless it's sure. The court doesn't exist to give him justice. The court exists to give him a chance at justice. Are they going to get it? They might. They might. See, the jury wants to believe. I mean, the jury wants to believe. It is something to see. I gotta go down there tomorrow and pick out 12 of them. Yeah, all of them, all their lives. It's a sham, it's rigged, you can't fight City Hall. But when they step into that jury box, I know you just barely see it in their eyes. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe what? To be a police officer means to believe in the law and to enforce it impartially, respecting the equality of all men and the dignity and worth of every individual. Every day, your life will be on the line, and also your character. You'll need integrity, courage, honesty, compassion, courtesy, and perseverance, and patience. You men are now prepared to join the war against crime and put the theory you have learned into practice in the streets. Lumet grew up in New York in the Depression. He has an intimate knowledge of the city. He's even been called the Dickens of New York. And this is evident in many of his films, including Q&A. Oh, stuff he took home maybe 100, 150 a week, that's all. But what a cop, Al, what a cop. I mean, like me, first through the door, the window, the skylight. Lumet's films have often been noted for the strength of their performances. This comes from his unusual practice of rehearsing with his actors for a couple of weeks before he starts shooting. What's that line? And I am that line. Nick, that was wonderful. Everything it should be. Something very valuable is going on, which is playing the vulnerabilities, playing the open wounds, playing a recognition of, of where it hurts. Uh, and I want to continue on that. Don't be surprised if, as we go, I won't do any of that this week, but next week, 
I may start to cover some of it over. I may say, keep the same thing going, but throw it away. Keep the same thing going, but pick up the pace. So that if we are defending against a feeling, or if we no longer care about a feeling, as for example, Charlie, I think there are a lot of things he doesn't care about anymore. But the vulnerability which you're playing now is extremely valuable, because then when we play I don't care, I still want a trace of that there, always, you know? Uh, one of the joys is to get on camera, and uh, those of you who've worked with me before have had this experience, and I say, open it up a little more, hide it a little more. You know, just slide up and down on the scale a little. And uh, it becomes a wonderful kind of shorthand for us, and you, 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 you'll know just what I mean by it. There's always a lot of talk about great rehearsal in the film, but there's very few directors that do it. Uh, I think this comes from Sydney's theater background and certainly from my theater background. I found it just, it's a pleasure because uh, um, you explore the character, you explore the situation, uh, nothing is set in stone. And I really don't follow the idea of spontaneity that it has to be the first time, you know. I think only through exploration of all the possible things can you really improvise. Glad to see I'm not the only case you're working In Q&A, Nick Nolte plays Brennan, a corrupt Irish-American police lieutenant who murders to protect himself. His crimes are discovered by Riley, an ex-cop turned district attorney, played by Timothy Hutton. Riley has to choose between his loyalty to Brennan as a fellow Irish cop and his desire for justice. But when I was on the post, shit, I was the baddest motherfucker on the block. I told those niggers on that corner, and some jive ass gives me that stick and gun shit. I try to, I hand my stick and my gun to my partner and we go in the alley and pa pa pa. that scumbag goes to the hospital. Go further on the imitation, so I really know what you're doing. Okay. You know? Yeah. Because we're... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go further on the whole, uh, on the whole thing. And I think, you remember that wonderful element, Tim, that we had a trying to... Try to go along with one. All in preparation for the transition later. Right, right, right. right, right, right. So that he's once again playing to an audience that's working for him. Yeah, okay. Okay. Action! You have no idea much, Mike. Come on. Now listen, if I want my brick bowl, I'll do it myself. Oh, look at fuck it. It's no secret. Listen, I believe in kicking ass. I've kicked ass in the 3 2, the 2 5, the 3 0, oh, the 3 4, the 6, you name it. But I'm respected. I mean, my first night on patrol, 147th and Lennox, I told those niggas on the corner, I said, when I'm on a post, the baddest motherfucker on the block is me. <laughs> <laughs> and then some jive ass gives me that stick and gun shit. He said, you yeah, motherfucker, I shoved that stick up your ass. I said, OK, asshole. I hand him to my partner. We go in the alley and wham, bam. That scumbag loses his teeth. He goes to the fucking hospital, right? Listen to me. Listen to me, Brennan. Uh... If you're dirty, you're going. Uh, and anything you ever say to me from now on, you should say it to me right on the q and I gotta stand here and take this shit from Kevin Riley's little boy? I wish you were dead. And if your father was alive, he'd raise a glass to that, too. Listen to me, Mike. If you're dirty, you're going. And anything you say to me from now on, say it to me in the Q&A. I gotta stand here and take this shit from Kevin Riley's little boy. Your father was alive, he'd raise a glass to that, too. Hey, guys, come in. Yeah. How's it going? The ethnic loyalties and divisions in New York society were an important part of Sidney Lumet's own Jewish background. When I grew up, there was a Jewish block and the Italian block and the Irish block, and they didn't dare go onto anybody else's turf. My father 
uh, was an actor in the Yiddish theater, and the Yiddish theater was collapsing in New York at that time. Uh, very little of it left, uh, not enough to make a, li a living out of. And uh, so I began working when I was five, and uh, and pretty well amounted to no dough if I didn't have a job. I was in the theater as a kid. That was in an enormously bubbling state politically. I remember when I was 12 and the Spanish Civil War had begun, I was in dead end at the time. And I lived in Brooklyn, and every night I'd be going back to Brooklyn on the subway with one of those little cans with a slot and collecting money for loyalists to Spain uh, on the way home. In those days, you could do it. In 1939, Sidney Lumet acted in the film One Third of a Nation, playing the archetypal depression kid. Crippled little kid Joey. <laughs> I figured it was funny. I, I think in a funny way it almost had something to do with starting directing because uh, when I got out of the army after World War II, and I'd been in five years, and, uh, and there I was, having not grown much, and I figured because of a part like Joey, that's what I would probably be doomed to if I s continued acting. You know, I'd be the little Jewish kid from Brooklyn that who'd get shot up in the bomber and then Clark Gable would get furious and pick me up in his arms and go wipe out a German machine gun nest. So that didn't seem very promising. So I guess that's why I drifted into direct directing. <laughs> a friend of mine, Ewell Brenner, was directing at CBS, this is the early days of television. And he called me one day because I had no dough and Ewell and I, this is before King and I, had literally been sharing spaghetti plates, sp canned spaghetti together. And he called, he said, come on in, nobody knows what they're doing here, this is great, you can get away with murder. And uh, I came into TV as his assistant, as his AD. And then when you were left to do King and I, I took over the show. I was doing two live shows a week. Uh, a melodrama called Danger, and a wonderful show called You Are There, which was, uh, I know it sounds ridiculous, but it really worked. It was covering any kind of historical, all sorts of historical events with modern news techniques. So we'd be there at Caesar's assassination, and uh, a correspondent would break in and say, uh, Brutus, uh, could just a few words, please? And I know it sounds crazy, but it worked. Three ninety nine B.C. The death of Socrates. You are there. Tony, the stone of the plate on Xenophon five minutes ago. Socrates! There have been rumors like this one Socrates! all day, and they were found to be false. Socrates! Ned Calmer, can you confirm this? Is Socrates to be released? This is Ned Calmer in the courtyard of Anatus' home. There's no sign here of any such event. As you can see, there are Plato and Xenophon still waiting for Anatus to hear them the last time. Citizen Plato, has Anatus acted in some manner to free Socrates? Popular resentment and confusion could well... Here comes Anatus now. And that is Polycrates, one of his main advisors. Observe, Polycrates, our two young philosophers, so nobly devoted to the cause of spreading truth. The sun is sinking fast, Anatus, and so with it, perhaps your regime. What shall I think of such uh, truth seekers? Sydney, being first generation American, uh, our parents came from the old country with, uh, you know, oppressed and. Uh, and uh, they came here, and this new freedom, they took it seriously. They, that, uh, you know, you were innocent until proven guilty, which, uh, and justice for all. And uh, the immigrants read the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence a lot more closely than most of us who were born into it, you know. I am a member of the Communist Party. Where have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Well, like many of his profession, Lumet found his political sympathies tested by the communist witch hunts in the early 1950s. Did you come in contact with the whole McCarthy Inquisition at all? Oh, yes. Uh, I was working in television then, and anybody who worked in television then, uh, of course, was right under the gun. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I'm framing my answer in the only way... I never appeared before House on American Activities Committee. My career was just saved by a brave sponsor. And he arranged a meeting up in his apartment. And it's amazing, you know, it's why... Uh, it's very hard to be judgmental about the people who did talk in front of congressional committees and so on. I know a lot of my friends are very bitter about it to this day. 
Uh, I just know that for myself, on my way up to that apartment for that meeting, I had no idea what I would say. I didn't know whether I'd grovel. I didn't know whether I'd behave well uh, in my own terms, which would amount to telling them to go fuck themselves. But uh, I just didn't know. I just didn't know until it happened. So um, I did behave well in my terms, and it turned out the only reason I kept working was that they had the wrong person. He had friends who were, uh, and acquaintances who were, who were uh, blacklisted, and uh, the later thing. He, he's, he's a, he's a, he's an old-fashioned American liberal. Not very many of us left anymore. Okay, are we ready? Now, all those voting guilty, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, that's eleven. Guilty. Oh, well, is Bonnie not guilty? One. Right. Eleven guilty, one not guilty. Well, now we know where we are. Boy, oh boy, there's always one. <laughs> so, what do we do now? Well, I guess we talk. Boy, oh boy. You really think he's innocent? I don't know. Lumet's first film, Twelve Angry Men, was based on a successful stage play by Reginald Rose. It's the story of a jury at the trial of a Puerto Rican boy accused of murdering his father. Henry Fonda plays the one juror who believes the boy could be innocent. In the course of the film, he persuades his fellow jurors, one by one, to put aside their prejudices and reach an honest verdict. Now, are you trying to tell me that this knife really fell through a hole in the boy's pocket. Someone picked it up off the street, went to the boy's house, and stabbed his father with it just to test its sharpness? No, I'm just saying it's possible the boy lost his knife, and that somebody else stabbed his father with a similar knife. It's just possible. Take a look at this knife. It's a very unusual knife. I've never seen one like it. Neither had the storekeeper who sold it to the boy. Aren't you asking us to accept a pretty incredible coincidence? I'm just saying a coincidence is possible. And I say it's not possible. Where did that come from? It's the same night. Essentially romantic. Uh, there's no way that that was ever going to happen in an American jury room. I've been in them, and I know. Uh, but uh, look, we're not doing documentaries, right? We're doing, we're doing. Uh, dramas and everything that, that implies and that includes fakery it's fake as soon as you bring a camera on it right it never occurred to me that that was difficult to do to do a whole movie in one room you know you come in with a certain arrogance uh when you're young i had worked out a real camera attack i knew that the uh the way to do it was to turn what was seemingly the disadvantage into an advantage so as a matter of fact as the movie went on over the body of the movie, I made the room smaller. Uh, the lenses got longer and longer, so the walls kept pulling in closer and closer. The camera kept dropping, 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 so finally the ceiling was right over their heads. Uh, so that actually the whole piece kept contracting. And dramatically, that's what the movie was about. Uh, and it was a movie. Well? Say something! You lousy bunch of bleeding hearts. You're not going to intimidate me. I'm entitled to my opinion. Rotten kids, you work your life out. Not guilty. Not guilty. Lumet quickly established a reputation for filming stage plays, ranging from American classics to Chekhov's The Seagull. I love the play. I love Chekhov. And I've had this running battle with critics about them accusing me of photographing stage plays. 
I don't really fight these battles anymore. I'm not interested in winning them. But uh, I remember at the time I used to get very aggravated about it. It's true I was attracted to a lot of plays because that's where I came from. But the fact that I use the original texts does not mean that it's any less a movie. In 1964, Lumet made The Pawnbroker, breaking new ground in his use of cinematic techniques to convey the memories of a Holocaust victim, played by Rod Steiger. What can I do for you? Nobody won. My diamond engagement ring. I want to borrow. It's glass. Glass? He said it was real. The original script indications were to uh, use real concentration camp footage, and I was just horrified that the writers would do something like that. And uh, so that anything that had to do with the concentration camp, I just tried to do the simplest non-graphic images uh, because I didn't want to get into a contest about making that seem real. Uh, a simple shot of just barbed wire and hands up there and a uniformed hand, you could see the helmet in the back just pulling the rings off the women's fingers. Try to keep it simple and, uh, and as I say, non-graphic, because it's, one can't, one can't exploit it. Wednesday or Thursday? But Lunch in the park. Wednesday's better for me. Wednesday, Thursday, whatever you like. All right. I'll see you then. I got the idea of it just by trying to figure out what my own memory is like when I don't want to remember something. And that's exactly the way it is, just kind of kind of little flashes, 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 and then if it's persistent enough, it finally just busts through and takes over. delighted me was that uh, it kicked up a, a big fuss among cineasts, but among audience, but with audiences it was absolutely accepted right away. Uh, nobody was startled or thrown by it. It was just, the picture wasn't interrupted. You were watching it and it all just seemed to unfold and be natural. Because you said that you're quite proud of the fact that people couldn't recognize a, a Cine Lumet film just from the way that films look. Absolutely. I think it's uh, critical to do that particular piece. That's what got you interested in the first place. And the whole idea of your own look, regardless of subject matter, is crazy. I think it's sort of critical egotism that that whole theory developed by, you know, dolly in on, on a copy of Proust on the coffee table and, aha, there was an influence on him and so on and so forth. And it's nonsense. Uh, that's not what, ma what makes an individual style. What makes an individual style is what you are interested in. What have you got to say and how are you saying it? In The Hill, Lumet showed his willingness to take on new territories by dealing with a British army camp. Sean Connery plays a prisoner who rebels against the insane punishments imposed by the camp's sadistic staff. Connery is a typical Lumet hero, struggling for justice in an enclosed male society. I'll make you into something the army can be proud of. You double, drill, do any damn thing I tell you. Roberts, you'll be lost, lost, unless somebody's shouting an order at you. When I was in North Africa during the war, uh, I, was, I was stationed for a few days outside of Oran, and there was a uh, prisoner's enclave there for American prisoners. Uh, 
everything from murder to getting drunk in Oran, you know, drunk and disorderly. And uh, there was a Moroccan band. We used to call it Music Hill on a hill in the middle of the camp, and they played all day. Now, I don't know how they stood it. I don't know how the guys in the band stood it. Uh, but I sure don't know how the prisoners stood it. And that's all you had to know to do that movie. That somebody could think of that. Lumet collaborated with British cameraman Oswald Morris in experimenting with visual techniques. This included a specific choice of camera lenses throughout the film. The nature of that movie was that literally that everything in the foreground becomes more and more distorted and everything in the background seems to recede more and more and become less important. Even though the focus is clearer, it's much farther away. And uh, I'd made a decision at the beginning of that movie that I was going to shoot the whole picture on three lenses. The first third was shot on 24 millimeter, second third on 21 millimeter, and the last third of the movie was shot on 18 millimeter. And that was everything, close-ups, the works. But that was the basic lens plot of the movie. And that was to give a sense of? A greater and greater human distortion and, uh, and background just receding, 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 losing its significance in relation to what was going on up front. So that you'd do a close-up of Harry and there'd be an army behind him. One of the things I always loved about uh, Ossie, and it's true of so many British cameramen, uh, is this sort of mad courage trying things that are uh, insane to try, like the scene where Stevens is being marched up and back in, inside the room. And I said, Ossie, why don't we just put, the, put Brian in a, in a wheelchair and uh, just follow Alfie around? And he said, well, where am I going to put the bloody lights? We'll need four walls in and the ceiling. I said, oh, I see you'll work it out. And he looked around and he said, I know what. I don't care if the lights are in the picture. <laughs> and he just put, put the lights wherever he wanted to. And we shot them. There they are in the shot and all. And they look wonderful because uh, it's part of the whole emotional violence of it. You were set for your ticket, you are. A left car, left car. Ba -ba -ba -bum -ba. Oh, hey, hey. Keep them up, boy. Keep them up. <laughs> <laughs> It's really a collaborative process for you filming. I mean... Always, you know, that, that's why I won't take that billing of a Sidney Lumet film or a film by Sidney Lumet. It, it's the dumbest thing in the world. Uh, I'm dependent, uh, if we were out shooting today, we'd be dependent on the sun. We'd be dependent on the clouds. It's, uh, and my job is to get the best out of everybody working on it and make sure that we are all literally going in the same direction. That's why I'm called a director that we're all making the same movie. A veritable sun shower. Everybody take a bath. Take a bask, a sun bath. Lumet's way of adapting to the needs of his subject is best seen in his films dealing with crime in New York. He collaborated closely with his actors in Dog Day Afternoon, the true story of a homosexual who robs a bank to pay for his lover's sex change operation. I was so nervous about the homophobia that exists here. Uh, I was very aware of where it would finally play. And, uh, and so I said to the actors around the third day of rehearsal, I said, look, it is very, very important that we not give them an excuse to cut out because this is a very extreme situation. And they can cut out on us very easily. They can, starting with laughter in the wrong places and uh, then they get like a wild pack. And so I said, I would like you to make this, these characters absolutely your own, really yourselves. No characterization, as close to you, what you are, as possible. 
uh, which is also what the movie is about. It's about the movie is about the freaks are not the freaks we think they are. They are much closer to us than most of us admit to. talking about? Put it on her. I can't do it, Sonny. Um, Sal. Sal, what? Where are you? He can't make it. Let him go! Come on, Sonny! All right, let him out. Let him out! Do what the gentleman says, Howard. Let him out. Let him out! I'm sorry, Sonny. Oh, shit. Stevie? Don't take the car. But how will I get home? Take the subway. We need the car. Stevie, the keys. I would say maybe 60, 65 percent of that movie is improvised in its text. So what we did was, by the end of the first week or the beginning of the second week of rehearsal, I brought in uh, my sound man and boom. And we uh, just followed them with the mic. And they improvised, and then a battery of secretaries would sit up that night and type up the improvisations. And then I would take that and cross after him and make, we made the text out of the improvisations. And it was wonderful for the actors and uh, I think very right for the movie. It was also the only way of doing the picture because uh, what was quite clear was that what was going to happen between Al and that crowd uh, out in front of the bank was, was going to be the picture. And so you had to be prepared for every accident. And those sequences were shot with four, four cameras. So. He was to yell at the guy, Attica, Attica, Attica. And then they started cheering him, and he picked it up. He smelled it. And then he went, and he started working the crowd. You like these real life stories, don't you? I like them because they're very, very hard. You'd think they'd be easy because you've got the real things to de depend on. Uh, but two things happen, like in Dog Day Afternoon. You are, you develop a sense of obligation about not ripping off the people that you're dealing with. There are real lives involved. And as much as uh, Dog Day Afternoon means to me, and as thrilling as I found working on it, uh, somebody went to jail for seven years. Uh, you know. Also based on true stories were the two films Lumet made about the New York police in the 70s. Serpico starred Al Pacino as an undercover cop. In Prince of the City, dealt with an officer on the drug squad, the SIU, who decides to expose the corruption around him, even though it means betraying friends, family, and ultimately himself. The typical Lumet hero, Danny Cello, played by Treat Williams, is torn between his conscience and the values of his society, as in this scene when he tries to explain his feelings to his wife. I feel lousy, Carla. The other night I was with my junkies. And I got mean. They break my heart, and I got mean. Remember it was like when I was just starting out on the roofs? How good it felt? I want to feel that way again. Oh. This guy, Capolino, he's going to force you to hurt your friends. People who've been good to you. Always when I hear you or Gus or Joe, any of the guys, you always say nothing's worse than to be a... A rat. A rat is when they catch you and make you inform. Nobody caught me. This is my setup. This is my action. 
And I'm never gonna hurt my partners. It'll happen. How are you gonna live with that? How am I gonna live with you while you live with that? The movie is about, as you notice, I always start with that, because that determines everything for me. Uh, a man being reduced to uh, where everything, a man who uh, loses everything, everything is stripped away from him, and he's reduced to uh, just a yes or a no in terms of his own conscience. Uh, but culture, job, upbringing, marriage, children, everything's taken away from him. Danny, I'm sorry. I keep trying to avoid these Fridays, but th this is important. Let me ask you. Do you remember a bust you made when you first came into SIU? This may help you. with a drug dealer who, um, who sees me and spits in my face. And during the audition, Sidney did that. He spit in my face. And it was an extraordinary moment because I remember he's gone much too far. And I had this enormous rage and I was ready to just kill him and, 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 and walk out of the, of the audition. But I didn't. I continued to play the scene. You are a fucking lunatic. You can't make a nutcase accusation like that stick, not on me. Not on you, then on Levy, Marinaro, Mayo. You know, half the SIU will be coming in here and they will cooperate. They will not cooperate. And he nearly all of them will cooperate. They're cops. In their hearts, they want to admit their guilt. That's the way cops are. That's how you got here. Don't you understand that? It was a strange situation where these police officers had to become corrupt in order to deal with the corruption. And I think that that really caused him enormous pain and suffering. And eventually, as a result of that, he tried to turn himself back. He tried to stop this, this thing that had happened to him, and it was too late. It was quite clear that he was going through these agonies of uh, conscience, and the government had none. <laughs> you know, the government absolutely threw him to the wolves. Uh, and uh, yet, uh, his struggle and what he did is so much more important, I think, than what the government did. And precisely because of that. Because he worked through something on a human level, and they never even considered the human level. So for you, personal kind of conscience is the most important thing. It's where it has to start. The problems of the New York police are again the subject of Lumet's latest film, Q&A. Based on a novel, the theme is not just internal corruption, but the way tribal loyalties within the police disrupt the course of justice. The man who wrote the book is a judge in the New York judicial system. And I asked him once whether the story was true, and he said, no, it wasn't true, but the people were. He had simply combined these people into a story of his own invention. This is the first time I've done a script by myself. And for, for that reason, I felt a very strong attack. I knew very clearly what I wanted to do with it. And uh, for some reason, again, that I'm not quite sure of, I do know the sound of police. I know what they talk, I know what they are, I know them. And so, uh, the writing of it went very, very quickly. Hey, that's right. You was a cop once, right? At the 2-3. That's right, Lieutenant. Well, it's a pleasure, Mr. Riley. It's about time they brought him from the force into here, right? Mm. It's a pleasure. I knew your old man. These cops like that made us the finest. Yeah, man, we were just telling some more war stories, then. 
My kid's telling us what cojones he got in the jungle bunny over here is laughing his ass off. You ain't nothing but a nigga with straight hair. Gentlemen, gentlemen, you violation of police department directives. Racist epithets are not permitted. Uh, excuse me, sir. Who the racist? Me and Jackie? With the Minotis, man. I mean, you damn lucky to get us. You know, we quit. Some federal judge take away your money. Now, Brennan, he ain't no racist. He hates everybody. He's an equal opportunity hater. <laughs> To me, at least, racism doesn't come because people are inherently evil. Uh, it comes because people are terrified of what they don't know and, uh, and a loss of control means that they don't know. And a character like Brennan, what drives him over the edge is the loss of control. And so essentially the fact that uh, the reason the movie is about racism. The reason the two themes come together is that uh, the new element is a threat. And so the bonding of, of uh, the, the ethnic groups becomes a way of defending oneself. The Irish family tradition in the police force is strongly felt by Lumet's hero, Riley. But his loyalty is severely tested when he realizes that he trusts a Puerto Rican drug dealer, a key witness, more than his own kind. I'm not going to stay there late. The crowd's too rough in these places. Do you know I remember you now? You served the 23rd precinct, no? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you had a good reputation among the Latinos, Mr. Riley. That's what it was about. I think I would love to, certainly for now, before we cover it up, because the opening beat of vulnerability is so good that the end of it is total friendship and understanding of him. Yeah. So. You mean you don't think I really hate him at this point? No, no. You got it made. It's again that lovely thing, Armand, about how practical these guys are. Yeah, they right. don't waste the emotion. I think it... Gives him a nice dimension. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's just and it's that, it's that opening beat and this closing beat, which he instinctively intuited, which makes him say, I trust this witness. Because he's dealing with, as we say in Jewish, a mensch. A word of my people meaning, you know. You hate guys like me, don't you? Well. 1600 bucks worth of silk in my back of And you with those Delancey Street originals. And you know? cops, you robbers. Not to mention our little competition here. Yeah. You know, some of this is going to get tough on you, Al. Because I want out, man. I want to get away from you cops and wops and junkies. Are you turning? Hey, who the fuck are you? You're talking to Roberto Tessera here, not Roger the Dodger Montalvo, OK? Clearly, the, the next two enormous problems, in my view, for this country are racism, which has never been really fully faced, and which is uh, really possibly going to destroy us, and, uh, and clearly the ecological problem. So uh, the part that moves me the most, for obvious reasons, is the racial problem, and, uh, which is what Q&A is all about. And, that's something to get angry over because it's a uh, it's a very long, 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 it's been a very, very long struggle and things are getting worse, not better, in my view. Sydney is a, is a political animal. Uh, and of course, social issues and political issues are very strong in his psyche and in his, just in, in Sidney Lumet, that's what, that's what he's all about. And that's why the the more controversial a picture is, the better it is for Sidney to make. Uh, many times his friends have to tie him in, in a room just to get him away from a project you know, that he gets all excited about. He loves everything. You know. He just gets excited about everything. When he finishes the film on Friday, he wants to go to work next Monday. And I think if the, if the next project is ready, it's wonderful. And if it's not quite ready, he goes anyway. And sometimes he comes a cropper that way. 
but he he really wants to keep keep working. He, he wants to turn out those movies. It's he, it's what he lives for. I think it's hard to pigeonhole me. There is a lot that I'm interested in. I do things for very odd reasons, which make sense to me, but which other people cannot figure out. I think I take a lot of risks, and therefore there's been a lot of bad work, a lot of very chancy, dicey work. But I'm very happy with that, uh, because I'm interested in the whole span of it. If you know anything about good work, you know that uh, the thing that nobody will ever admit, which is that it's accidental. Uh, I'm not being falsely modest. There's a reason why the accident happens to some of us and never will happen to other people, which is that we know how to prepare the groundwork for it. But uh, finally, whatever that magical thing is that makes a first-rate piece of work occur, it is an accident. And uh, so I'm just a great believer in quantity. More chances for the accident to happen. You can't afford this. I can't, and God knows the department can't. We've got an election this year. Hey, Bloom. Can you really bury some of this pig? Bigger. You're breaking my heart, Bloom. Well, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. If we are to have faith in justice, we need only to believe in ourselves and act with justice. I believe there is justice in our hearts. Sydney would rather be on a set than anywhere. You ought to ask his four wives. <laughs> well, you know he's notorious for kissing. I once said that he's the only director I know. When I go on a set, I make sure that I have some mouthwash before I greet him. <laughs> Producers love him. He's always on budget and on time. But I'm going to divulge a little secret. Now that I'm a producer, what Sidney does is he adds a week on to the schedule and adds another couple of hundred thousand to the budget. So when he finishes, he says, see that? I came in a couple of hundred thousand on the budget and a, and a week under. It's a lot. 